YouTube. If you're not in the service with us this morning, you are missing out. You missed out on a wonderful time of praise and worship. You missed out on a wonderful time of prayer and testimony. We have prayed for those who are sick. We have prayed for those that are in need. We have given God the glory. We want to remind you, please, if you can, make it in the sanctuary. Make it here to be able to worship with us. We would love to have you here with us. We're studying right now a series we're in on prophecy, current events, and the end times. I've told y'all when we started to get into Matthew chapter 24 as often as you can. Every week I'd like you to read through Matthew chapter 24. It's going to give you an outline of the things that are to come. This is Christ. It's called the Olivet Discourse. When he got there and he laid everything out. Because he wants nothing held from secret for us. From us. He wants us to be aware of the things that are to come. I like what Paul said. Paul said, I would not have you be ignorant. That's a word we're not allowed to use anymore, I don't think. But Paul used it so I can use it. He wants us to know what is happening. He doesn't want us to be caught unaware. So I want to go immediately this morning into Matthew chapter 24, if we could. I'm going to read verse 6 through 8. It says, You will hear about wars. You will also hear people talking about future wars. Don't be alarmed. These things must happen, but the end still isn't here. Nation will fight against nation. Kingdom will fight against kingdom. People will go hungry. There will be earthquake in many places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. This week in the world, we heard not only of rumors of wars, but we have actually seen war begin. If you keep up with the news, and I told you to keep your newspaper beside your Bible, you would have seen over the weekend... Prime Minister Netanyahu said, we are at war. Well, even while I was preaching at the Methodist Church, driving over here, I got an update that they have officially declared war, Israel has, against Hamas. This is the first time in 50 years that Israel has declared war. They have had a very unstable but relative peace. But all of that is out. They've caught up 100,000 of their troops. We are at war. In a completely surprise attack, we saw where Hamas brought across the border. Those who came in, terrorists came by land and by sea, and for the first time, they came in by air. They came in with paragliders and parasails and everything to get over the walls. And of course, they came in by air with 4,500 rockets launched. Just to give you an idea, the last extended thing we had was 11 days, and there were only 3,000 over 11 days. This time we saw 4,500 in just 11 hours. Now, the source of these are Iran. You can do your own summation of where Iran suddenly got the money to buy all of these. I'm not going to get deep into politics. I refuse to do that. But they attacked, the first major attack in 50 years. And they also attacked on the Sabbath. But beyond that even, they attacked during Sukkot, the time of the recognition of the harvest. They came and they attacked on harvest season, at harvest time, a holy holiday. Psalm 122 in verse 6 tells us specifically, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you, we are told. Now understand, there are multiple connotations of Israel. And specifically in prophecy, in current events and the things to come. And there's Jerusalem. If you remember, Jesus told him, he said, I want you all to go forth. And he told you to go where? He said, I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to go to Judea. I want you to go to Samaria. I want you to go to all the world. In that relation, Jerusalem is your immediate area where you are. So when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which I do specifically, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I have friends who live in Jerusalem. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But you know what? I also pray for the peace of Bunky. I pray for the peace of Lone Pine, St. Landry, Marksville, wherever we may be, Bayou Chico, Clearwater. Wherever you may be, we're praying for peace. You need to pray for peace every day. The scripture tells us we have not because 
We ask not. When's the last time you prayed for peace? How about you close your circle? When's the last time you prayed for peace in your own household? You do realize there are some people that have no peace in their own household. How about you pray for your neighbors that they would have peace? Ooh, I've prayed for my neighbors. I don't know if they watch this, but we have literally had the state police in our, our neighbor's yard twice because they were physically fist fighting brothers against brothers in the yard. So I prayed for peace. Now, God acts in the way that God chooses. They just moved out. So I'm not saying they got peace, but guess who got peace? I got peace. Pray for peace. Peace. Look, I raised two daughters in my house. The thing I prayed for was peace. Imagine that God's children, the number of us, and what does he, what does he say to pray for? Peace. Peace. Scholars who know more than I do, which isn't hard to do, but they read the words a lot better than me, and my brother Dara here I count as a scholar of the word and the original text. And When they read Matthew 24 and Jesus warns about wars, he immediately goes in the point he warns about famine. And they say that it's tied together. He's not talking about famine because of drought or famine because of this or that. This famine caused specifically because of war. Because of the actions of men. Man-made famines. Again, Hamas attacked during the harvest. They've disrupted the harvest. How about Ukraine? The Ukraine war. We don't talk a lot about it. It's different politics one way or another. But I don't care about the politics. I care about the grain that's not going out of those ports. To feed the hungriest countries in the world. Ukraine is known as the breadbasket. That's what they are known as, and here's why. They account for 10% of the world's wheat harvest. 10%. 15% of the corn har- harvest. 13% of the barley harvest. And here's the one I knew nothing about. They're well over 50% of the sunflower oil that's produced in the world. Now, for a little while, Russia had a deal where they could bring some ships out because some of those ships went to Russia with that grain. But they've stopped that. They, it's just sitting there. They're not allowing them to get the grain out. Church, in the midst of this, we all have to move, though, from an idea, a mindset of scarcity to a mindset of abundance. We're always talking about, oh, this is going to happen and that. We, we saw what happened in COVID, right? We, we couldn't buy things. The, 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 the shelves were empty. We bought six giant boxes of Bisquick and put them in the freezer. I think we're just now going through the last one because we couldn't find flour. There was, there was nothing. Now, I've yet to figure out the run on toilet paper. I am and have been a respiratory therapist for 30 years. COVID is a respiratory disease. I do not understand why the whole world had to stock up on cases of toilet paper. I bet there are people that haven't bought toilet paper in three years. But that was because of a respiratory virus, something happened. How about whenever we have a hurricane and everything runs through? Those are but tiny, small indicators of what is to come. The disruptions in the food supply, made either by war or by the, 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 the commercialization and Corporate mentality of farming, I've told you all that. Over half of our farmland is now owned by a few corporations. They control everything. Whatever is to be planted, to be harvested. You do know that with a lot of subsidies, they don't harvest at all. They just plow it under. Whenever we Christians begin to read in the Word of God and we read about famines to come and the things that are to come, We are not to look at the scarcity. We are instead to look at the opportunity for abundance. Whenever the whole world reads this, and very few churches are preaching revelations anymore, the end times, because a lot of people read it and they get scared. They see fear. In the book of Revelation, I see hope. I see opportunity. I see my hope for salvation. I see that my Christ comes back for me. But I see the opportunity to be able to show the world what is to come. 
I see an opportunity to spread the gospel to them, to share the gospel, to show them that they don't have fear. They don't have to fear. Whenever they see our peace and our joy, they should come to us and say, why are you not afraid? Why are you not afraid? Pat, are you afraid? Why are you not afraid? My God is in control. My God is in control. My God has the future. My God has this world. My God specifically has me in his hand. If he saves me from it, in it, or through it, I'm all right either way. We have that peace. The world does not have that peace. Our study of prophecy, current events, and end times today finds us again in Revelation, and we're in chapter 6, which aligns with Matthew 24, 6. Revelation 6, 5 through 6, and it says, When he, Jesus Christ, opened the third seal, I, this is John, the apostle, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and the wine. When the third seal is open, we see that the black horse comes forth. And in his hand is a set of scales. Many of us are old enough to remember these scales, at the, the real scales at the, at the grocer, at the, at the butcher shop, where... They'd put one scale on one side, one on the other, and they'd put scales off and on, and it would tell you what something weighed. Well, what he has determined with his scales, and it may be by scarcity through the famine, or it may just be by the fact of cost controls, and they think that what they say things cost or don't cost, this manufactured inflation that we have, things just cost what people say they're going to cost. I'm in the stock market. I know what something is worth. It's worth what somebody's willing to pay, and they'll always push it higher. But in the scripture we read this morning, when he comes out with his scale, he is saying that a day's labor will buy you a handful of wheat. How often do we pray the Lord's Prayer, which was actually our prayer given to us as a model. But in that prayer we pray, give us today our daily bread. You do realize that 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 prayer means so much more to so many people around the world. We don't pray for our daily bread. We pray that our needs are being met, that I can pay my mortgage, that I can pay my car, that I can buy this $5 a gallon gas. That's what we're praying for. But they are literally praying for their daily bread. I've got to tell you, if I read Scripture correctly, I think that's coming here to us, where we will be praying for our daily bread. The greatest way to bring dependence upon Christ is to take away our comfort. The things that we're used to. To turn us toward Him. God gives us His Word to inform us, not to scare us. God does not want us to be caught unaware. Jesus does not want us to be caught unaware. Whenever whenever God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels said, God, God. Abraham, your friend, are you going to tell him what is going to happen? He said, yes, I will not hide anything from him. Nothing is hidden from us. Nothing should take us Christians by surprise. And understand this, no one is going to trick you into anything. We're going to get into the mark of the beast, and everybody says it's this, that, and the other. They won't take this shot, or they won't do that, oh, mark of the beast. You're not going to get tricked into it, all right? It will be a conscious choice that you will make. And Jesus, in Matthew 24, said that many of you, my followers, my believers, will be led astray. That is why I preach so hard to those that are here in the pews, because I read what Christ has told us. But Jesus told us this also in Luke chapter 21, verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with excess and drunkenness and cares of this life so that the day come upon you unaware. Things can distract us. Things can come into our lives, and we're not looking. We're not ready. We're not aware. We become so comfortable in our lives that we don't see the things that are happening around the world. A lot of times we get into a thing of, like you see, we say, 
Me, my four, and no more. I'm worried about me, my wife, and my two kids, and that's it. Me, my four, and no more. But it's time, church, for us to expand. That's why we're doing this thing, what we're doing on December the 9th. They call it Love Louisiana, but we're calling it Love Our Communities. To be able to pour out into people's lives. To have them to be prepared. We're also going to have prayer tents there. We're going to have Bibles distributed there. We're going to have literature out there for them so that they would not be caught unaware. They need to know these things. And there's some practical things. I've asked the LSU Ags to come set up some booths with, tent, with um, seeds, to distribute seeds, to the planting charts to tell what to plant at this time, what to plant at that time, how to raise chickens. You realize we've lost all of that. Generationally, we have lost all of that. Thank God my daughter plants her little garden every year, and she's got it. She's on it. She's got it going. But most have lost that. Whenever the food begins to become scarce, they don't even have the ability to know what to do. How, what do I do? I want them to be aware and to know what is coming. I want us to be prepared. And one of the best ways to be prepared is to read all the stories in here. Start with the Old Testament. Start with Genesis. Those are not just stories. I met someone one time. She was 35 years old, and she thought that Noah's Ark was a story written by someone just like, I don't know, just like Harry Potter or whatever. I don't know. It just, it's a story. She never realized that it was in the Bible. never realized it was true. Read these stories. Read what the Old Testament has, because it will tell you what you've gone through and how to prepare for what's coming. And then in practicality, we're looking at that. To make it better understand this book of Revelation, which is the last, I want to go to the first. I want to go to Genesis this morning. Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 4. Those of you who went through Sunday school, you know these stories. Some of you do not know these stories. This is a story about Joseph. One of my favorite lines in the Bible says that a Pharaoh came to power who did not know Joseph. We are raising kids and grandkids that do not know who Joseph is. I told this story one time of Joseph and the coat of many colors. They said, I know know all about, I know Joseph. Who's Joseph? They said, that's Jesus' daddy. I'm like, I give you credit for knowing that that Joseph, but this is another Joseph. They don't, they don't know. And I fought to us. Everybody ought to go to Sunday school. Sunday school, Sunday school, everybody ought to go to Sunday school and learn the golden rule. I used to walk the halls singing that. If you got a choice between Sunday school and church, go to Sunday school. I said it right there. And Wednesday night, amen. Anyway, that's not in my notes. You got that for free. Let's go to Joseph. Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 4. Now Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Behold, there come up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump. And they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them. They stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. Verse 8, so in the morning, Pharaoh's spirit was troubled. He sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, all of his wise men, all his counselors. Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. But someone mentioned to him Joseph. And Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. God will give Uncle Lionel a favorable answer. God will give Sister Claudine a favorable answer. If we only ask. The only person left to ask was that, and here's I can tell, the only Jew... The only believer in all of Egypt. And that's who he came to. When this world begins to fall apart like it's going to, they're going to need to find somebody to come to. And I hope they're going to come to you, Sister Monica. Them little babies, them kids are going to come to you, Miss Sister Monica. Miss Monica, what's happening? What's happening? Tell me what's happening because their mamas and daddies may not know. They're going to come to you. 
In the prison, they're going to ask you, John, what's happening out there? What's going on? Stephanie, they're going to ask you, what's happening? Pharaoh called Joseph and he said, what does this mean? And just like Joseph, you should say, it's not me, but it's God. He's going to give you a favorable answer. We see it in verse 25. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, the seven good cows are seven years. The seven lean and ugly cows that come after me, after them are seven years of famine. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them there will arise seven years of famine. Egypt, during the seven plentiful years, you gather all the food of these good years that are coming. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through the famine. Church, I believe that the years of plenty have passed already. How many of you remember that long string when your 401k was up, not down, and your investments were doing good? You were paying $2, $1.86 for gas. Plenty. We had what we needed. The grocery stores were stocked. We had no need of anything. We were good. How about this? How about the fact that we had all those years of peace? People can holler and complain about they take the, take the Bible out of the school, take prayer out of the school. You realize we've had 250 years of freedom to be able to walk out in any street corner of this nation and preach the Word of God. Period. We have had freedoms that we have wasted, church. You can say what you want. Say, oh, no, they don't have No, you can say what you want. Well, my job won't let me. Well, go find another job. You can say what you want. If you work for me, say what you want. Preach the gospel. Do your work. Then you can preach the gospel. We've had freedoms that we've neglected. We've had money that we've wasted. Oh, how can you say that? I can say that because I can walk by, I can drive by all the churches I drive by between here and there, and I see brand new Yukons and Suburbans. They say $80,000. Why? We've wasted. I see the big houses. We've wasted. We've wasted. All that money could have either been set aside and put in a savings or it could have been used to spread the gospel. I can tell you where it hadn't been going, huh, Sister Stephanie? In the church offering plates. And I got pastors all across this country that are friends of mine. It hadn't gone there. We have wasted opportunities. Those years of plenty, I'm afraid, have passed. The world's soon going to call for help, and they're going to call among the nations, and they're going to find none. Finally, finally, they're going to look to us. They're going to look for the one that's sitting in the corner with joy on their face, smiling while the whole world is falling down. When we have a prayer meeting for rain, I always told you, look for the person that brings the umbrella, right? Right? The world's going to start looking. They're going to start asking y'all questions. Do you have the answers? Do you have enough of the gospel in you to give the gospel to them? Do you have enough scripture within you? I'm not going to ask for hands. I don't want to see it because I've passed this church and another church. But many people get their Bible off their cell phone. I tried to get a hold of a friend that I have in Israel right now. I could not reach her. She's over there for a month. I could not find her. Finally, this morning, at 3 o'clock, she called me, and I called her back. Her cell phone just stopped working. How many of you have known the fact that sometimes they just don't work, and it's not there? We can't always say, what was that scripture? Open your phone, hit the search, and say, oh, there it is. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I don't memorize as much of the scriptures because I don't have to. They're right there. I'm telling you, you better start putting them in here and in here. There is a time coming. I've read so many stories of those men who were POWs in Vietnam, and they began to roll with scripture. One to remember this, one to remember that, one to remember the first verse of a hymn, one to remember the third verse of a hymn, and they began to feed off of each other. Church, you better start putting it in here. The most mighty man I ever knew to memorize scripture was Brother Donald. 
They say, oh, he had a gift, he had a gift. They got in his car one time, and there were yellow post-it notes all across the dash, one corner to the other, and every one of them was a scripture. It wasn't a gift, it was obedience and diligence. Like I say, everybody wants what you got, but they don't want to do what you, got, did, what you had to do to get it. They want what you got, but they don't want to do what you had to do to get it. They say, oh, well, he can roll off scriptures. Lawrence was the second best I knew at that. But you had to study to show yourself approved. You can't just sleep on the Bible. It's not going to come through osmosis like they used to tell us in science class. Coach Britton used to tell me that. I visited with him in the hospital Monday. Prayed with him. I've got friends that have set aside enough food to last their family for years. I'm not telling you who they are. <laughs> yeah, but I've been in those rooms, those prep rooms. I've seen the five-gallon buckets full of MREs. Jerry, you want to live on MREs for five years? And chicken a la puke? I'm like, no, I'd rather just let God welcome me in thin. They call it malnourished, but I'd go out thin before I do that. The problem with their buckets full of food is they've got enough for themselves and their family. But I said, what about your neighbors? He said, what? What about your neighbors? You can watch your neighbors starve? We've got a good close friend neighbor now. She'll come out. I don't know how I ran out of flour. Can I borrow some flour? Sure you can. The other day, we go knock on the door. I, I ran out of tomatoes. I don't know how I did it. Can I borrow a can of tomatoes? Sure you can. You borrow a can of tomatoes. What are you going to do when they come knock on the door and they say, I have nothing for my family? What are you going to do? You going to let them starve? What you going to do? Start to prepare, people. And the best way to prepare is to tell them to prepare. One day they're going to knock on the door and they're going to say, I have, I have no hope. I don't know how we're going to make it through this. And you're going to say, you know what? Such as I have, I give. We preached on that for months. Such as I have, I give. And you know what I have? I have the Spirit of God within me. I have the Prince of Peace within me. I'm not going to worry about what's going on. I'm going to give it all to him. Please, neighbor, let me invite you into the presence of God. Let me tell you how I can have this peace that you can have. You're hungry? Let me tell you a story about a woman who was at the well who was thirsty. And he said, you can thirst no more. I promise you can hunger no more. But you have to know what to tell them. I truly believe these food shortages are coming. And I honestly believe a lot of it's not going to be, like I said, the rain or whatever. It's going to be man-made. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not. I just see things as they are. I see a country that burns 50%, I'm sorry, 40% of its corn. Burns it. Absolutely burns it. Turns it into ethanol. Puts it in the car and burns it. 40%. At the same time, 10% of our population is hungry and starving. And we're burning corn. The world looks at us and just shakes its head. It's just like whenever they were starving in France. And Marie Antoinette told them what? They said, they have no bread. She said what? Let them eat cake. They ain't got nothing. They ain't got bread, they ain't got cake. We tell them the same thing. We're burning 40% of our corn crop. Globally, 11% of the world is hungry, but one-third of the world is malnourished. They get to eat something, but they don't have enough quality of food. Corn is an incredibly nutritious stock for the body. It is the best thing for poor people to be able to eat, to get the nutrition and we're burning it. You want to know how much we burn? 30 million acres of corn are turned into ethanol every year and burned in our cars. We have 400 years of liquid crude oil under the ground. Why are we burning corn? Because somebody found a way to make money. Because we got crop subsidies. We don't have oil subsidies. Only God knows how much natural gas we got in this country. No way to count it. And yet we're burning food. 
You say, oh, well, what's it do? What's it do? You know what it does? It's taking nutrients out of the soil. Every time you run a crop, you're burning up what? Nitrogen, phosphates. You're taking them out of the soil. So next year when it's time to plant, what do you got to do? You got to put in nitrogen, phosphates. But here's the problem. Where do they come from? Where do your nitrogen and phosphates come from that our farmers put in the ground here? The bulk comes from Ukraine. Ukraine is your largest source. Nothing's coming out. You've seen the farmers, what they're paying for that? What they're paying for those fertilizers and nutrients? It's not sustainable, but they just keep burning the oil. And it doesn't just affect, the quality of the ground doesn't just affect, remember, your, your vegetables and your, your fruit and your grain. You say, well, I don't eat any of that. I'm a meat eater. What are they feeding to your cows? What are they feeding to your hogs? What are they feeding to your chickens? Oh, I don't eat any of that. I just eat fish. What are they feeding to your pond-raised fish? Grains. Tell any people the math's not there for sustainability. But even with the food shortages that are to come, the famine that comes forth with the black rider, there's one thing that worries me even more. And it's found in Amos, chapter 8, verse 11 through 12. This is God speaking. God said, Behold, the days are coming. He didn't say the days may come, the days could be coming. He said, The days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. He said, They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Why won't they find the word of the Lord? Because the word of the Lord is not being preached in the pulpits of this country. There are very few pulpits where you're going to be able to go to today and hear the word of God preached. And with the YouTube and Facebook, you can go try them all out. They'll, they'll tell you a poem, they'll tell you a story. They'll do a little of this, a little of that. But I want the Word of God. I wonder how many are preaching out of Revelation this morning. Basically none. They may throw a little bit of Word of the God. They may throw a little love in there, a little of this, that, and the other. But how about repentance? How about that? How about the gospel? What is the gospel? How about that? I keep telling you how to preach. Why is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus Christ incarnate, Jesus Christ who lived, Jesus Christ who died and bled for our sins, Jesus Christ crucified, Jesus Christ arose, and Jesus Christ coming. That is being preached in so few churches. That is why there's a thirst and a famine for the Word of God. The Word of God is not being put out. One of the most popular TV preachers, when he puts a scripture up, it comes up in the bottom, subtitled. So I watched it one day with the sound off. I got one little scripture to begin with. I kept waiting, and that's all I got. And then I went back and watched it, and that one scripture was totally out of context. It told me how God wants me to have a better life, and everything's good, and preached to me health and wealth. There was, at the end, a way to be able to contribute. Health and wealth, health and wealth. Oh, yeah, God wants, that's what he wants. John, the revelator, wrote revelations. He died in the mines on the island of Patmos. They boiled him in oil, they hung him, they did everything, they couldn't kill him. And finally, a old age took him, working in the mines. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs if you think we're all destined to live a long, prosperous life. Read that. It's not promised to us. In this world, you will have trouble, tribulation. But, but, I have overcome this world. But does that mean you're not going to be taken out of this world? God is going to protect us. He's going to protect us from it, in it, or through it. Whenever the three Hebrew children went into the fire, could God have killed everybody there and they never went in the fire? Sure he could have. 
Could God have had them die in the fire and raised up the ashes? He could have. But God instead got them to go through the fire and come out on the other side. They didn't even smell like smoke, like Stephanie said. I think, church, we're going to be brought through this, but not all of us. We're going to get in the next few weeks looking in on the rapture, where it takes place. But I'm telling you, the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan is poured out upon us, the church. He hates us, and we have to be prepared. Whenever this famine of God's word comes up, you know who's going to have to be the ones to provide? You are, you are, and you are. You realize that many of your friends will never come to church. They'll never come to this church. They'll never come to a church anywhere. You are the gospel to them. The old saying was, you are the only Christ that some people will ever see. You are the only gospel some people will ever hear. Folks, you've got to have it in you. If I come asking for a cup of sugar, you ain't got it, you can't give it. If I come asking you, explain to me the word of God. Explain to me how I find Christ. How do I accept Christ? If you don't have it in you, you don't, can't give it. I'm going to go even farther. If you do not have the desire to spread the gospel, the good news, with someone else, I don't think you have it. If you have never, ever taking the time to share with someone else what God has done for you, I don't think you have fully accepted Christ. I don't think we can. God has commanded us to go forth into the nation, preaching the gospel, and make what? Disciples. If you have never led anyone to Christ, you need to start putting that within you, the ability to be there with the right word at the right time, to relieve that famine. You'll share with your neighbors whatever you've got, but you've got to have it in you. Mark 16, 15 told us what? Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. If I got two chickens, my neighbor needs a chicken, I'm going to give them a chicken. Whatever they need, I'm going to give them. I've got to be able to have the gospel to give the gospel. They're going to start coming. I told you there's opportunity in Revelation. Start, things start getting worse and worse and worse. People are going to make opportunities for you to share the gospel with them. What's happening in this world, they'll say. Let me tell you what's happening. Even better, let me tell you what's going to happen. Let me show you what's going to happen. The people in the world need to be attracted to what we have. If we're in famine and I'm fat, they're going to come ask me what's going on. Just a fact. If they're all in trouble and strife and we're showing peace and contentment, they're going to say, tell me why. Be ready with that answer. Because Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Church, are you hungry for righteousness? Righteousness is a fancy word for doing the right thing. Are you hungry for righteousness? If you're hungry for righteousness, you're hungry to do the right thing. And what Jesus told us was the right thing to do is that single command. Go into the world and preach the gospel. Go to Jerusalem, which is at your house. Go to Judea. Go to Samaria. All around the world. But start right where you are. A friend of mine loves to say, bloom where you're planted. The job you have, God gave you that. And God put you in that situation among those people for a reason. There's somebody you need to speak to. The family you have, who? <laughs> They're your family for a reason. I bet you got someone in your family you can spread the gospel to. They need to hear some good news. Be quick with those answers. Look for those that are hungry. Do you have what others want? If you worship the Prince of Peace, you should have peace. Because realize that they worship the ruler of this world, and he is the author of chaos and confusion. The world is scared. I'm telling you. I believe we'll be here when that wrath is poured out, but I believe we have the opportunity to be able to share the word of God with so many people. We must be prepared to bring as many to Christ in this time of crisis. We're going to get to in the next few weeks the fact that when a trumpet sounds, when the trumpet sounds, are you ready? How many of you had your cell phones go off this week? Be whatever, blah, blah, blah. 
Oh, yeah, they said that would be the end of the world. The phones would produce graphite. I don't know. It's, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. So I put it on Facebook. I said, rapture check in. Who's still here? I wanted to know. Somebody told me. They said, well, apparently you're still here. I said, there's Wi-Fi in the cloud. But church, I've got to When that trumpet sounds, you going to still be here? Are you ready? Are you ready? Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt? I used to love to say, do you know in your knower? It's not biologically or grammatically correct, but do you know in your knower that when that trumpet sounds, you're going? If you are not 100% sure of two things, one, that you will go when the trumpet sounds, that you are saved in Christ Jesus, I want you to come up here. Question two, if you do not have the ability or the desire or the want or the capacity to share the gospel with someone else, I want you to come up and I want to pray for you. Do you know Christ, and do you know Christ well enough to the point to share Christ with someone else? If you do not, I want you to come forward, and I want to pray with you this morning. No music, nothing emotional. Anyone in this church? All right. Then by your actions, every one of you should have someone with you in church next week. Not your spouse, unless there's some option. Let me rephrase that. You should have one in church with you next week that's not here with you today. Family, neighbor, friend, enemy, even better. I want you to bring someone to church this week because you're going to share the gospel with someone this week because God commanded us through Christ Jesus to do just that. I want you all to stand with me this morning in agreement. We have come together as one body committed to grow the kingdom of Christ. Amen? Amen. God has told us another commandment. He told us specifically to pray for peace in Jerusalem. And remember that as a physical Jerusalem, it's also your home, where you are. I want us to pray today as a congregation the words of the psalmist David in his prayer. I want us to pray Psalm 122. Pray with me. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers for my brothers and companions' sake. I would say peace be within you for the sake of the house of the Lord our God. I will seek your good. Amen. Father God, as a charge to all of those who are here today, Lord God, fill us with the desire to spread your word. Lord, let the Holy Spirit come into us to remind us of the things that we have read, the things that we have heard. Lord God, let the Holy Spirit quicken our minds to have a response to those who are in need. Lord God, let us be available to those around us. Let us show to them the peace that we have, the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that comes only from you, Lord God. Jesus, you are our Prince of Peace. Father God, I pray even today that you give us the ability, the desire, Lord God. Plant the opportunities in our lives to be able to share your love with others. Father God, I pray unto all of those that are here, Lord God, that you give them the desire, you give them the health, Lord God, you give them the mental faculties to be able to share your gospel. I pray blessings upon all of those here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your attention and for your attentiveness. Thank you for those who participated in Camo Sunday. No one can hide from God.